Uh, I won't say too much more about Professor Williams since I've introduced him four times now, and <clears throat> I think he likes it less each time. But <laughs> let me just mention a book that he's written that I want to recommend to your attention. It's his most recent book, The Shadow of the Antichrist, Nietzsche's Critique of Christianity. Uh, our own Dr. Cole has this to say. Stephen Williams writes on Nietzsche with philosophical astuteness, theological depth, and cultural relevance. He has picked a most formidable critic of Christianity to engage, and does so fairly and accurately. Moreover, he writes with his usual flair and Welsh lyricism. This is a significant book to read in these postmodern times. I've been studying the picture, and though Professor Williams' name is bigger than Nietzsche's, unless he had a mustache, I think I'm working out that this is Nietzsche. But uh, I'd prefer to look at Professor Williams, so please come up and address us. Thank you, Professor Van Hooser. This is good, isn't it? Uh, the warmth makes my lips and mouth quite dry, so it's good to, to have this. Uh, no, that, that is certainly me there. Uh, I used to have a moustache at one stage. <clears throat> in fact, my grandfather was a minister in South Wales. And uh, in the days when I had a moustache, probably this would be in my 30s. I had a moustache more recently, but I'm not going to speculate out loud about that right now. Anyway, in my 30s, I went to to preach in the church where he was minister in South Wales, where he had been minister. He died many, many years before. And uh, after I came down from the pulpit, uh, a lady came up to me and said, well, it's good to see you, uh, but you don't have half a good moustache as your grandfather had. So obviously a man is judged by his moustache in Wales, and now Professor Van Hooser appears to do the same here. But anyway, that's, I'm, I'm relieved now that his introduction is over. I've, I've learned to fear the Van Hooser introduction more than anything else in life. You know. It means I can relax for question time because I know the introduction is over. <clears throat> in the last lecture, we touched on two familiar questions in connection with election. The first concerned the relationship between a call genuinely given and responsibly rejected on the one hand and a predestination which is effective on the other. The second concerned God's preferential treatment of some humans to the point of their eschatological inheritance. The first question is about the internal coherence of ideas. The second about the substantive theological credibility of election. They are most helpfully broached in that order and that will be our task this afternoon. Obviously, we have arrived at a perfectly familiar place as regards the doctrine of election. We have been here many times before. Whatever was wrong with his ideas, however far we have advanced beyond them, it is surely hard to repress a sneaking sympathy for Schleiermacher's hermeneutics when he proposes that biblical interpretation embraces both grammatical historical information and the psychological penetration of the author's mind. No theological prurience here, at any rate if it is in the service of an ambition to understand scripture. Would the questions that we ask, especially about coherence, have occurred to the authors of the New Testament, or Old Testament for that matter, in whatever form we might put them that is appropriate to its witness? A laudable eagerness to prevent theological speculation from abandoning biblical ground can lead to excessively confident claims about what would never have crossed the mind of a biblical author. Brunner, whose treatment of election is noteworthy, appears to be rather guilty on that count. More often, the boot is probably on the other foot, at least as far as systematic theologians are involved. We too easily fuse biblical horizons with our own. Some have challenged Augustinianism, which you will recall I advocated in the single predestinarian moderate form uh, on a biblical basis this morning. Some will challenge it, have challenged it along the following lines. On the Augustinian account, 
God has not given sufficient grace to unbelievers for them to respond to his call. He has given the predestined sufficient grace. Yet, unless sufficient grace is given, a positive response is not possible. Hence, God has issued a call to many who have no means of responding positively to it. In that case, the call is not genuine. The alternative proposed is that God has given sufficient grace for unbelievers to respond, but they have rejected it, vice versa, in the case of believers, to which the Augustinian responds by asking what then accounts for the response of the predestined. Are we saying that they accepted rather than rejected without any particularly efficacious activity on the part of God by virtue of some positive inclination of their will and thus their nature? Now, even if Paul or Luke or John would not have thought in terms of sufficient grace, however you go on, on that question, even if they wouldn't have thought in terms of sufficient grace at all, did they ask materially similar questions? Would they have recognized the question that we ask, but told us that its resolution was a mystery properly left in the hands of God? Is Paul close enough to saying so in Romans 9? Who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Or would the writers have recognized our questions and instructed us on how to approach them constructively just as long as our mood was not truculent? Erasmus thought that Paul would have answered differently the same questions in Romans 9 if they had been put without defiance. Or did the questions of the biblical writers arise in a form entirely different from ours within their world of thought? to the point of being virtually different questions. Do we most radically fail to understand the New Testament, particularly against its Jewish background, and so rather spectacularly miss something theologically vital and import something theologically deadly into the problematic? Charles Simeon. Anyone here heard of Simeon by any chance? Have I mentioned Simeon before? Oh, well, let me introduce him. No, you heard all about him on Tuesday. Those of you who didn't, well, I'm sorry you can't catch up right now, but let's hear a bit more about him anyway. Charles Simeon fearlessly observed that, quote, there is not a decided Calvinist or Arminian in the world who equally approves the whole of Scripture. There is not a determined votary of either system who, if he had been in the company of St. Paul, whilst his writings different epistles, would not have recommended him to alter one or other of his expressions. They may say otherwise, says Simeon. People say they're equally happy with all scripture, but they secretly are not. Judging by what is written, at least in scripture, categories of thought different from our theologically familiar ones are present there. Of course, we have to tread warily in treating the relation of language to thought but even if we are unsure about the relation of word to concept or concept to belief, the worry easily arises that if biblical writers handled language and the connection of ideas differently from the way that we handle them, this might rigorously entail that their very ideas were different. It is a worry that might linger even after we have attended as meticulously as possible to the various contexts in which the New Testament authors said what they had to say. Having said all this, we must reckon with the strong possibility, surely, that despite our widespread cultural estrangement from the Hebraic and, for that matter, Hellenistic worlds of thought, the New Testament witnesses did indeed recognize a mystery in the relationship between the work of God and the acts of humans between a discriminate and effective predestination and a wider rejected summons, recognized it in a form not unfamiliar to us. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things, says Koheleth, the teacher, willing us to apply his words beyond the realm of physical nature and wishing the theologians would remember that, quote, God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. Would New Testament writers, steeped not only in the history and the prophecy, but also the wisdom of Israel, have simply urged us to let things stand theologically 
Those who refuse the gospel summons are responsible for having done so and cannot cry with Luther, Ich kann nicht Anders, I can do no other. Those who receive it are drawn by the Father and cannot thank God with the Pharisee that they are unlike other men. These are complementary realities whose relationship is hard or impossible to state, but whose conjoined reality is unaffected by our difficulty to state it. If that is the case, perhaps John's Gospel is the most instructive of all New Testament writings for our purposes, directing us to the conclusion that theological thought should not aspire to synthesis and resolution, but that on the contrary, paradox becomes sharper and not eased upon reflection. Does it thus point us towards the way in which we should appropriate the Hebrew mind, that is John's gospel, appropriate the Hebrew mind under culturally different reflective conditions? Simeon quoted John 5.40, "'You will not come to me that he might have life. And John 6, 44, no man can come unto me except the Father who has sent me draw him. He quoted these in order to caution against system and to urge that the preacher's task is, quote, the proper and seasonable application of them both. Truth for him lies neither in the center nor in a hybrid and not in a systematic resolution, but at the poles of the paradox. Simeon did not completely disclaim system and thought that scripture might contain one, but one that is wider than either Calvinists or Arminians allow. Had he developed his thinking, he would presumably have done so by musing on the phenomenon of paradox. So is it the task of a systematic theologian who shows all the signs of being a fellow traveler of Simeon? Now I try to conceal my preferences and sympathy carefully, but some of you may have picked up a hint that I might be rather partial to Simeon here and there. So let me come out in the open. Is it the task of someone who shows all the signs of being a fellow traveler of Simeon to adumbrate a system that enshrines paradox? I actually think that Simeon exaggerates his point. Post-apostolic preachers have a different task in some respects from that of any New Testament author in that we have to expound a particular letter or passage with the whole canon in mind, and the responsibilities of the theologian are correspondingly expended. Perhaps Simeon's wider system can be found. We might, for example, drop the word system and try instead to outline conceptually the features of a theological Weltanschauung that embraces paradox. Kierkegaard is a good place to start. For Kierkegaard, an existential system is impossible and he developed a critique of systematic thinking that extended way beyond particular opposition to Hegel. Interestingly enough, Kierkegaard's earliest theological entry in his journal was on the subject of predestination. But I'm not proposing to follow this through for two reasons. That is, not trying to follow through the, the adumbration of some sort of conceptual scheme for understanding paradox. Two reasons. The first is ad hoc. These particular lectures are not the place to attempt what will inevitably turn out to be a theoretical enterprise, and bearing in mind the brief in the council lectureship. The second goes deeper. Although Simeon thought that there might be a wider system, he obviously did not need it in order to carry out his ministry. And I doubt if it is in the first rank of necessity for us. Paradox, said Kierkegaard, is the source of the thinker's passion. And the thinker without paradox is like a lover without feeling, a paltry mediocrity. It is not intellectual passion that we want to satisfy here in our context first and foremost. Whatever be said on behalf of Kierkegaard's profound and searching authorship, we want to find a place for the soul to settle. It will not settle if the mind is fundamentally unsettled, but mind does not need to explore its own furthest reaches in order to enable the soul to leave, live at peace with God's truth. Simeon thought that life reconciles what thought cannot or cannot readily reconcile. This is surely significantly true. If we are convinced of the truths or realities in question in our, our theme, then we know that they are existentially true. 
if they are existentially true, our inability to conceptualize their relationship to each other, I mean particularly the general call and the effective predestination, our inability to conceptualize their relationship to each other inhibits only our intellectual curiosity. And it is doubtful whether missionary or apologetic responsibilities force us to go far beyond the internal needs of the church, although I'll want to say a brief further word about that tomorrow. The relationship of the truths in question to our lives can be spelled out in terms of responsibilities, warnings, humility, peace, etc. It is true that election in the form of single predestination leaves many with existential perplexities and worries, and we shall shortly address this, and also I shall be addressing it tomorrow. But if we are exercised by the intellectual problem of elaborating the relationship of an array of propositions, if we may validly treat them as propositions prized out of their homes in various particular speech acts, we have to ask why it is that we are troubled. For systematic irresolution is neither the issue nor sign of an embarrassing theological failure which lets down Christianity, lets down Jesus Christ himself. On the contrary, the biblical realities in which theologians should be trading are the sheer deep ontological and existential realities. Those things by which we should measure all things, not themselves subject to extrinsic or systematic canons of measurement, the true expression and proper manifestation of what is the case. Ours, as Duns Scotus put it, is indeed theologia nostra, our theology, rather than theologia in se. So we must ask whether we need to grasp truths in the interrelationships of conceptual form as this form appears to us. As this form appears to us. When you hear, hear the word appears, what comes up on your radar, I wonder? It's a cue. Enter a giant in the land. Now, whether or not he knew it, Simeon, in passages that I have not quoted, made remarks similar to those of Bishop Butler in the 18th century, to the effect that if the natural order contains so much mystery for us, <clears throat> why should revelation be discredited if it contains mystery? Butler is giant enough to get on with, but it is the mighty shadow, of course, of Immanuel Kant that looms largest on the western horizon when we hear the word appears. On close observation, does it turn out to be the shadow of a Goliath to challenge the pilgrim who would true valor see? Or is it the shadow of a mighty philosophical rock within a weary theological desert land? The older among you may pick up those hymnic allusions. Kant's distinction between things as they are, things as they appear, with his accompanying banishment of metaphysical knowledge, initially seems hostile to orthodox theology. And certainly we should quarrel with something fundamental in the structure of his thought. To read Kant after reading scripture is to feel like a guest the day after the wedding in Cana who encounters a man exhaustively examining the properties of water to see what capacities it has. For Kant reckoned on investigating the compass of human knowledge without reference to the active power of God in revelation. But to disagree at the level of presupposition is not to dismiss the whole substance of a proposal. Kant worried about the application of interpretive schemes to those things which lay outside the boundaries of our perception. He dealt thoroughly with our schematization of perceptibles too, but thought that you could not simply lift the scheme that you use for those things and apply them to the realm that transcends perception. We view things here on earth under the forms of space and time, and we factor into that scene an usable concept of cause. Leave that scene, try to interpret concepts, and you quit the realm of the knowable. Metaphysics, he put it, is a bottomless abyss. Again, the quotation, a dark ocean without shore and without lighthouses. And if handling causality in empirical daylight is hard enough, what becomes of it in the metaphysical night? Pure reason lands us in antinomies, said Kant. One of those antinomies is particularly interesting for us. The third one treated in the transcendental dialectic in Kant's critique of pure reason. It concerns our freedom. According to pure reason, there is and there is not, that's the antinomy, of course, a causality attributable to freedom. 
Now, if any of you asks a question about Kant after this session, you will probably be rudely brushed aside as I am no expert on Kant. His biographer tells us that two students in his day fought a duel because one accused the other of not understanding the critique of pure reason, telling the other that he needed to study it for 30 years before he could hope to understand it, and another 30 years before being allowed to comment on it. For some reason, the biographer doesn't tell us the other guy took offense at this. Well, I was a late beginner and didn't begin to start reading Kant until I was almost two years old. Uh, so please save your questions until around 2014. That's a way of inviting myself back to Trinity in 2014. But what is particularly interesting and instructive for the student of Christian theology is that Kant's music, musings on freedom contributed to his skepticism about the realm of speculation, in part because he was perplexed about the relationship of moral freedom to moral evil. It is too easy to conclude that Kant had a shallow view of evil in human nature. In one respect, that is so, by the standards of theological orthodoxy, we might be singularly unimpressed by Kant on this point and believe that he rose no higher than semi-Pelagianism at highest, as revealed by the end of Book One of his religion within the limits of reason alone. But Kant puzzled over moral agency. And his puzzlement over moral agency was brought on by the coexistence of an insistence on human freedom and a conviction that radical evil clings to human nature. This conviction, so unimpressive to the orthodox, dismayed fellow wayfarers on the Enlightenment, that is the conviction of radical evil dismayed them, on the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment way. Kant thought that the will had willed itself into bondage. How can you understand such a thing? And how on earth do you get yourself out again? For you were meant to apply to earth and not to any heaven in such a matter. Yet Kant turns for enlightenment in the direction of the story of the fall and the story of redemption through Christ. Two, he doesn't buy them as they biblically stand, but neither can he dismiss their illumination. In his very fine study on fallen freedom, Kant on radical evil and moral regeneration, Gordon Michelson summarizes the Kantian outcome like this. I quote him. In some profound and awful sense, I am opaque to myself, considered as a moral agent. The lesson is clear. The problem of evil brings Kant closer and closer to the insight that reason is not fully self-governing, but is subject to forces too murky to specify. Others, theologians and philosophers, might be outraged at what Calvin wrote in the Institutes, but not, I think, Kant, although I have omitted some words where I think Kant might have more of a problem. So how Calvin writes. I deny that sin ought less to be reckoned as sin merely because it is necessary. It is not from creation but from corruption of nature that men are bound to sin and can will nothing but evil. For whence comes that inability which the wicked would freely use as an excuse, but from the fact that Adam willingly bound himself over to the devil's tyranny? Now, what Kant said was, that's Calvin, what Kant said was, to have a good or an evil disposition as an inborn natural constitution does not mean that it has not been acquired by the man who harbors it, but rather that it has not been acquired in time. Hence, he's perplexed about this. Yet this disposition itself, he says, must have been adopted by free choice, for otherwise it could not be imputed. Nor, given what he says about accommodated speech in Scripture, would Calvin have met Kant with unqualified hostility. Now, I do not want to identify Kant too closely with the Christian tradition. There are serious differences. Nor, indeed, do I want to comment on Calvin's words either. But it is striking that behind Kant's delineation of the parerga, the non-rational elements in religious life, there is this puzzle over radical evil in relation to freedom. Now, Kant certainly has other things to say which could profitably engage us from his musings on selfhood to his elaborations on that first sentence of the preface to the first edition of Critique of Pure Reason. This is the first sentence. Human reason has this peculiar fate that in one species of its knowledge it is burdened by questions which, as prescribed by the very nature of reason itself, it is not able to ignore, but which, 
as transcending all its powers, it is also not able to answer. However, we must take our leave of Kant. If the preacher does not need resolution, Simeon, and if the philosopher needs to live without it, Kant, will the theologian insist on creating his or her own space? Now, I'm not entirely binding myself either to Simeon or to Kant. Unexpected bedfellows as they are, their concerns in any case overlap rather than being identical. But have I given them too much opportunity to squeeze out the theologian? I have admitted that predestination to life entails that some are apparently passed over in predestination. The objection was stated in the last lecture. I stated it myself in the lecture. Surely it is the task of systematic theology to make an elementary deduction, someone might say. Some are passed over, equals some are actively passed over, equals reprobation. In fact, you have neither to be a rocket scientist nor a systematic theologian to make that deduction, though perhaps only a systematic theologian is capable of missing it. What do we make of it? Well, of course, we are talking about a non-reactive, eternal, antecedent or pre-temporal decree of reprobation, a determination of individual destiny, albeit effective in Congress with human sin, of which God is supposedly not the author. But scripture, in Scripture, any reprobative decision on the part of God is presented to us in terms of time. It is responsive to human wrongdoing in time, even if the response does not originate in time for him who is its Lord and creator. It may seem to those of you who are familiar with it that I'm effectively adopting the position given a classical confessional formulation in the Lutheran formula of Concord in its full and impressive article on predestination which denies that predestination to life is contingent on God's foreknowledge of humans' use of their freedom, but affirms that it does work that way with reprobation. It is contingent on God's foreknowledge of our sinfulness and sin. Is that position I'm taking? Well, no, it seems to me the conceptual resolution is not possible along those lines. The formula does well to forfeit symmetry I'm glad of that, and as is the case generally in the history of debate about election and predestination, we might have comparative preferences for one formula rather than another, even when questioning the relevant conceptual framework. Theological statements can be like an arrow in flight, guiding our perceptions in one rather than another direction. But it seems to me that the flight of Concord could never have found and should not have been aimed at its target. In setting aside symmetry, it does not in effect do so well at shrugging off the legacy of speculation. Its formulation on foreknowledge and reprobation presumes to trace phenomena that appear in time back to the eternal counsel of God and then proceed to order foreknowledge and determination in that eternal counsel. But we can no more break through to peer at the eternal counsel of God uninvited than could the Israelites at Mount Sinai. We might have that invitation in the case of the positive uh, salvation of the elect. But even here, the door is only slightly ajar when we ask about the relation of time to eternity. When we do not have the invitation to penetrate with our minds up there, the theologian's motto must be recalled. What is the theologian's motto? Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. And I'm not sure that the text allows theologians to do what the body of Israelites were not allowed to do, and to go ahead to eat and drink and see God. Richard Baxter's words are sobering. One of the greatest sins of divines is to dispute unrevealed things about the nat nature of God. I do not think that we can safely make inferences about the relation of God's doings in historical time to the supposition of an eternal and immutable counsel in the case before us, the case of reprobation. Many of us believe in the reality of both divine wrath and of divine passibility. Yet, those of us who believe that affirm 
that these, that is wrath and passibility, do not belong to God as do love and peace. For there is no mutual wrath between the persons of the eternal trinity nor perichoretic inner suffering either. Wrath and suffering are brought on by. They are reactions to human deeds. Yet, at least within a broadly classical view of God, we do not believe that these are eternally unknown to him who knows and foreknows all things. At the level of imagination, this may not be difficult to conceive of. I can now anticipate, and some of you have heard me say this in other contexts, I can now anticipate the anger or grief I will feel at some specific or inevitable event in the future before it has happened. Perfect anticipation, impossible for humans, would mean that an event entirely novel in time is not novel in experience. We cannot knowledgeably translate this conceptually to terms fitting for God, and the cases of wrath and passibility illustrate the problem in our attempts to conceive of the relation obtaining between will and nature in the imminent being of the triune God. To argue for an antecedent degree of reprobation on the basis of the immutability of a divine will executed in time appears to me to stray into metaphysical speculation again at best. Where scripture contrasts an effective call rooted in predestination with a rejected call which it roots in culpable stubbornness, where scripture does that, we must not upset its proportions by an inference to reprobation, which is prima facie logical, but turns out to be metaphysically complex. And why ever get ourselves into the position of attempting it? The cause of human sin and resistance lies within humans. But God can harden, direct, and channel its expression in time, as well, of course, as reversing it in grace. And in accordance with his counsel, he can so act that there is some sort of concurrent causality involved, using causality rather loosely there, in the things of time. To my mind, the religious problem is not how to conceptualize all this, but why anyone should feel bound to conceptualize it. It is true there is a danger of arbitrarily calling halt. Failure to accept the logical implications of a belief or set of beliefs can amount to covering with the pious cloak of scripture either a lack of interest in systematic exploration or a lack of competence in systematic exploration or a disingenuous lack of willingness to face systematic implication. But we all cry halt somewhere. As Wittgenstein said of philosophy, theology is knowing where to stop. We must accept both the absolute truth and the absolute sufficiency of what scripture discloses to us here, I think. Are not the contours of the reality that we, that we need to know laid out for us rather precisely in biblical revelation? It is not a revelation which inspires hand-wringing, quietly embarrassed confession of mystery. It is a revelation which exposes reality precisely according to its profoundest existential dimensions. It is a fact that those who are not predestined to life were given in time the real and not spurious opportunity to lay hold of grace. It is a fact that God did not, by predestination, secure them for his kingdom. Theology is not a pride of any task. It must inquire about the whole of the biblical revelation one way or another and in a form that particular biblical writers were not called on to do. And it must consider the intellectual implications of whatever integration it makes. And I do not doubt that particular themes and particular contexts do call out for more or for less speculative expenditure of theological time. But we should not upset the biblical balance, threatening with obscurity or marginalization what is plain there, or highlighting what is obscure or hidden there. Why exactly do I need to know the nature and limits of human freedom? in our present context. I am aware that I possess whatever kind of freedom that is attendant on and entailed in my responsibility. I am aware that I can be held to account for resisting grace. I am also aware that I cannot for the minutest second to the minutest degree congratulate myself for anything. I am aware that the God who elects and predestines in love only bids me do anything because he is at work within me to will and to do. 
And this deep religious sense is no escape from rigor, the failure of some third-rate theologian or fourth-rate Christian to think honestly and thoroughly. On the contrary, what is existentially the case at deepest ontological level is known precisely in existential mode. Existential appropriation is not the product of a failure to grasp the real. It is the form in which the real is grasped. Does it matter that I have no idea to what extent grace is theoretically resistible? No idea of how predestination works in relation to freedom? No idea of how divine passing over works in relation to the rejection of the gospel? Does it matter? I don't know. Personality itself, said P.T. Forsyth, is a-logical. And it forms a unity in which truths cohere with practical effect, which will not harmonize and cooperate, which refuse to be systematized. So keen as I am on Abram Kuyper, I'm not convinced that Kuyper was right to call in the terms that he did for uh, what he described as, as a clear reflection of the wisdom of God in the logical consciousness of man, man, his language. But Kuyper does finally say, finally, F-I-N-E-L-Y, does finally say, does well say, that it is in prayer that we unite the diverse fragments of our lives. And Simeon believed that it was in prayer that things evidently came together which cannot be grasped in intellectual abstraction. Now, we should gloss this, I think. The insight is important in Simeon, that things come together in prayer. You remember I mentioned that on Tuesday night? Let's gloss it a bit. It is not that God is automatically transparent to us and we transparent to ourselves in prayer. In my better moments, I may admit that I try to project an image before others. It might even occur to me that the habit is so deeply ingrained that I am unaware of it, though everybody else is aware. In my wiser moments, I may admit that the perception others actually have of me is certainly not the one that I think they have of me and not the one that I've tried to project. But I seem to myself to be better and wiser still when I go to the quiet place and with ingenuous sincerity admit all this and much else to God who sees in private. There I seem to be honest, but actually are we not often more self-deceived in that quiet place than anywhere else? Precisely because we feel protected from ourselves. We carry even into that quiet and private place an image of ourselves. As Bonhoeffer put it with characteristic candor, quote, even in my little room, I can produce quite a remarkable public demonstration, subconsciously making myself the observer of my own prayer before God. So in appealing to the integration of existential truths in prayer, I'm not suggesting the prayer that prayer is the guaranteed secure place of theological insight, but it is the place where we realize how little we know about how human responsibility and divine decision are intertwined. For both human action and divine action are a mystery to us, rendering their relationship a double mystery. And because evil is in the mix too, rendering the relationship a gray mystery. The dialectic of sin, as Kierkegaard put it, puts it, in the sickness unto death, is diametrically contrary to the dialectic of speculation. So that is the uh, question of coherence. A desire to make sense of the connection between God's choice and his wider call is often fueled by the fact that the notion of God's electing choice is a problem in the first place. So I go on now to the theological issue, the second thing I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, the theological issue of predestination or election in its own right. And you'll remember that I'm not saying those terms are always to be used interchangeably. I'm here presupposing things said both uh, this morning uh, and, of course, in the Thursday talk on Old Testament. But it's intrinsically problematic for many people. It seems to cast a shadow over God's mercy or God's justice or both. This is the existential worry that many people have. And so we come to the second question flagged up at the start of the lecture. There is a well-worn response to this difficulty which arises here, one which is well-motivated and yet, I think, remains unsatisfactory. This is the response 
which is well motivated, and yet I want to question it. None of us deserves God's mercy. It is by definition not owed to us. Neither deserved nor owed, it is distinguished from justice. No one can complain when it is not meted out, for the alternative to it is justice, not injustice. In fact, the wonder is that God should have mercy upon any. Now, there is nothing here that I should want to query as such, but it appears to me incomplete, and it's in its incompleteness in danger of misleading. That we have no claim upon God's mercy, that grace must never be understood as anything other than grace, is religiously and theologically fundamental. We shall never think luminously upon anything without an accompanying sense of sin, which, as it deepens, increases our wonder at mercy. But paradoxically enough, the outlook which I am in some respect questioning risks losing it matters too much from our, too little from God's point of view. From our point of view, we may indeed stake no claim to mercy, but God may be constrained in a wondrous form that escapes us. He may have an inner constraint not to leave all sinners devoid of salvation, having determined to create a world in the first place. His will may not be indifferently related to his nature in such a matter, as though his will could go either way, because there was some neutrality of nature, take us or leave us. As far as God is concerned, the power of love may be expressed in the world of sinners only by his having mercy. Now, I've used the word may, where you may think I'm quietly saying does. But it is sufficient that matters be cautiously expressed for two reasons. Firstly, we do not know need to go further to make the point. The point is, can we know God's mercy to be other than how I have described it in the mode of possibility? No, not, I think, from Scripture. But second, using the modality may signifies that the relation of freedom to necessity in God may be quite different from anything that we can conceive of on the basis of earthly analogy. Grace may both be entirely free and simultaneously subject to an inner determination in God that is, or accords with his nature, including, therefore, what is necessary for him, within him. From the metaphysical point of view, let us leave to God himself the relation of necessity, nature, freedom, and grace, while confining ourselves to a religious point of view. So it is as well to be tentative at this stage. In putting something up as a possibility, there's no question of cunningly flouting the boundaries of God's accommodated self-revelation, sneaking in speculation by the back door while placarding metaphysical agnosticism at the entrance. On the contrary, we are asking what the biblical depiction of God allows. Such is the power and reality of a mercy unleashed in history that we cannot be sure that it could have been otherwise with God while being entirely sure that we deserve not a whit. If we insist that mercy was purely optional from a divine point of view, a kind of equilibrate liberty of indifference. If we insist on that, we at least run the risk of becoming like that representative French gendarme of whom G.K. Chesterton speaks. Uh, somewhere in his Father Brown stories, I didn't take down the, the reference. Some of you may know the Father Brown stories, but somewhere in it, he talks about someone who was typical of that uh, French member, French, typical member of the French typical French gendarme, um, who could make mercy colder than justice. Good one, isn't it? Don't uh, tell your wife, Kevin, that I've referred to the French in these terms. Well, if you do, remember to say I was quoting Chesterton. The insistence that God, as it were, could go either way on this. If we insist that categorically, dogmatically, it seems to run the risk of becoming like uh, Chesterton's gendarme. He could make mercy seem colder than justice. Bart, Bart certainly alerts us to something important here. And Hooker's words are worth pondering too. The being of God is a kind of law to his action. Anselm magisterially combined the loftiest idea of God's transcendent majesty with the supposition that if God has created humanity for communion with himself, God's own purposes are defeated if no humans attain it. And in that way, there is an inner divine constraint to save. Now, it is not a trail I follow here, whether it is a promising or not. 
we don't have to fear too don't have to peer too far along that trail to see where it might lead. On the other hand, the trail of mercy which I've opened out opens out on a scene where peculiar light is cast on the phenomenon of existential worry over predestination. While we contrast the predestination of some to the passing over of others, we appear to be contrasting mercy and justice. However, when we accent instead the contrast between predestination and a genuine but rejected summons, we are asking about the relation of one mercy to another. For what is a summons to repentance but an expression of mercy? Mercy, as Melanchthon put it in his classical apology to the Augsburg Confession, incorporated in the Book of Concord, mercy has the clear command of God, for the gospel is the command which bids us believe that God pardons and saves on account of Christ. When Luke tells us that the Pharisees and experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves, even if we do not indiscriminately bundle together every example of God's summonses or purposes, when Luke says that, we must ask, what was that but a saving and merciful purpose? This appears to me a crucial point, and this is where I want to reconceptualize the issue as familiarly set up. The question of the relation of God's justice, God's mercy, arises in context where his justice never ever left his mercy out of account as the general summons shows. And his mercy never leaves justice out of account, as atonement shows. It is one thing for an anxious soul to ponder the relation of mercy to justice. It is another thing to ponder the relation of one mercy to another. Ignorance of the first, understandably, whether or not justifiably, generates existential anxiety. But why should ignorance of the way one mercy is related to another generate any existential anxiety? There is usually a snake in the grass, said Cotton Mather, when predestination, this doctrine of godliness, is hissed at. In my subconscious, am I not saying, well, if no one can enter the kingdom unless predestined, God ought to have predestined everyone? With the word ought, I accuse God of injustice. What appears as an appeal to the university of God, universality of God's mercy turns out to be an appeal to his justice. God is not just. Thus hisseth the snake. I'm glad to get that phrase over with. All kinds of possibilities occurred to me about how that might be uh, misworded. God is not just. The woman you put here with me she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. Indisputably correct. Granted, she was given to me for companionship, a gift of love. Granted, you let me name her. And yes, I was with her when it all happened. But yet, Lord God, A, she's the one who took it. B, she's the one who gave it. Ergo, C, injustice. You will surely take that into due and proper account. Eve's response to God's question. The serpent deceived me and I ate it's probably too cryptic for us to know just how far she is palming off responsibility at this point. Earlier, in, in going towards eating the fruit, she had been deluded. She succumbed to maya, as the Hindu terms illusion. For she rightly saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. But she only thought that she saw that it was desirable for gaining wisdom. Illusion. And sustained illusion is insanity. Adam and Eve had yet to acquire the experience of sin that Israel acquired. An experience which, said Jeremiah, profit to the heart deceived. It could actually share with the nations by way of example. He tells the people this in what is perhaps the single most poignant chapter on human sin in the whole of scripture. That's chapter 2 of his prophecy. Yet, the people are puzzled at the incipient injustice of exile. So God asks the people, Jeremiah 2.9, why do you bring charges against me? Perhaps sin itself is so puzzling that we should not think the puzzle compounded by complaint at the injustice 
of punishment. If Genesis begins and Jeremiah reaches one high point in the exposure of sin in the Bible, Malachi, closing the Christian Old Testament, signifies the same state of affairs. It is surely a twisted spiritual condition which gives rise to the questions asked here. And they are apparently questions about God's justice. Malachi begins with the starkest announcement of election. I have loved you. G Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. And he closes with the direst of warnings, lest God strike the land with a curse. In a passage, the order of whose verses is reversed in the Septuagint, so that the prophecy ends with a softer recollection of Moses. Of all the prophetic books, Malachi most sustains the disputatious style occasionally found in prophecy, uh, particularly for the benefit of the Old Testament experts here. I intend the word disputatious neutrally in respect of literary genre. I'm aware that there are several more refined characterizations proposed of the style of Malachi, but please don't ask me what those characterizations are, or if you do, I'll pass over the questions to you. The people hurl their questions in Malachi. How have you loved us? How have we shown contempt for your name? How have we defiled you? How have we wearied the Lord? How do we rob you? That is God. Even if the bare text does not make it clear, historical and canonical context surely reveal that these are not inquiries born of innocence, though perhaps born of ignorance, the fruit of prolonged and accustomed insensitivity, not much blunted by return from exile, nor is the prophet always faultless. Jonah, son of Amittai, is supposed to prophesy against Nineveh. He goes there under duress. I know what you are like, Lord. You tend to relent from sending calamity. In the case of Israel, that's welcome. But Nineveh, a place which is a military threat to Israel, idolatrous in the root principle of its urban life, people who know nothing about your law and probably can't even tell the right hand from the left. It doesn't deserve the chance to repent. Where's the justice in sparing some Ninevites and threatening some Israelites? Now, granted a rhetorical indulgence here, but it is uh, Monday afternoon. We can be a little indulgent. But my colleague, uh, Desi Alexander, urges, us, urges me, urges us to find in Jonah protest against God's justice. Deep down, Jonah, if you have no right to be angry, why are you angry? Who, says Paul, are you to answer back to God? Paul's question has been regarded as perverse, irritably dodging the hard questions about God's justice in election. Now, of course, our exact interpretation of its force depends on our interpretation of his whole argument at this juncture. But clearly, the apostle is expressing something axiomatically presupposed in godly thought. He's not wheeling in a testy interrogative when his argument runs out of steam. We may be unsure of much in relation to election, but what we can be sure of is that God's righteous and just. This is not a conclusion to be suspended until we have explicated his ways. It is fundamental in a biblically formed consciousness. Forming this consciousness is more important than solving the riddle of election. In his own eyes, says the psalmist of the wicked, he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin, Psalm 36. In our own day, if we have one highly developed moral sense, it is surely the lightning capacity to detect any injustice done towards ourselves. And that blunts more than hones a proper appreciation of justice. Then is the justice that we ascribe to the acts of God sui generis, unconnected with even the finest mortal justice? We remain here with our ordinary general use of justice meaning fairness, albeit a deep fairness. However little or largely its English use overlaps with biblical notions that we translate by this term. Debate over whether our language about God is univocal, equivocal, or analogical in relation to ordinary language can falter at an early stage if we assume that there is such a thing as standard, ordinary language use of terms. In the case of a term like justice, we have now become especially cognizant of the instability of any natural definition of that word in light of the absence of a broad theoretical 
moral consensus in the West and of our awareness of extra-Western moral and legal norms. In addressing the question of justice, and I'm beginning to draw to a conclusion here, I do not think that we can be quite satisfied with either Calvin or Luther. Let God be true is the primary axiom of all Christian philosophy, says Calvin in his commentary in Romans 3, 4. In defending a double predestination, he insisted that divine justice is not a lawless operation. Such a thought is abhorrent. Nevertheless, the justice of God is hidden and not transparent. Quote, though this uh, quotation is actually from his exchange with Piggius. If a mortal man should pronounce his will and command and make his volition a sufficient reason, I admit it would be tyrannical, but to transfer the principle to God would be sacrilegious folly. How dare we judge God's justice by our natural standards? And on this, the whole question of predestination hinges, Calvin tells Piggius, that is, whether there is no justice of God except what we can conceive. Calvin constantly averred that the cause of damnation lay in ourselves, but with equal constancy averred that God's decree lay behind our sins as it lay behind Adam's fall, pressed on whether this meant that God decreed not just actions, but the state of the heart, Calvin admitted that this was so. The hand of God rules the interior affections, no less than it superintends internal, external actions. And it seems to me that Calvin's discussion of providence and his institutes shows that divine causal action is unequivocally at the heart of this. And equivocally may be a bit strong. How this can be reconciled with a justice which holds humans to account for their sin and responsible for their damnation, Calvin does not profess to know. But it is our business to submit ourselves to the truth. Now, Calvin's position on rep reprobation as such is not my quarry here, rather what he says about justice. And I, I can, I'm not persuaded by him at all. Surely our problems with God's justice in reprobation may not arise solely from illicit theological application of canons of natural justice external to Scripture. They may arise from considerations that are internal to Scripture, from God's justice manifested there. One thinks, for example, of the meticulous provisions in the Pentateuch for the ordering of social life, provisions which increasingly obviously, as we penetrate the prophets, manifest God's heartfelt love for social justice. Granted, these provisions are not always transparent to us. Granted, they pertain to the external, pertain to the external ordering of life. Granted, the cluster of issues thrown up, for example, by feminist approaches over the last decades. But the point is, they're indicative of something in the very character of God. Above all, there is Jesus, implicit center of all our thinking about election. Perhaps it seems that I have dodged in these lectures Bart's, Bart's claim that Jesus, the word, is the hermeneutical center of scripture. And I know that Hans thinks I'm completely inconsistent or something, or completely unclear on this, or at least is waiting to be persuaded. Now, we shall touch again on this tomorrow. Suffice to say that here that we are bound to consider God's justice best we humbly can in the light of the revelation of God in Jesus Christ, as we are bound to do with the whole question of election. The reason for making reference, Christological reference here, is to bolster the point that our questions about God's justice do not necessarily stem just from assuming the relevance of an extra-biblical or normative natural justice. And Luther surely leaves something to be desired here too. De servo arbitrio, the bondage of the will, as it's often translated, had an interesting career. In subsequent lectures on Genesis, Luther digressed to chapter 6 in those lectures, 26 of those lectures, to say that he was worried about how his earlier words could be taken when he spoke there of the absolute and necessary unfolding of all things. We should look to Jesus Christ to understand the will of God, he now says. Apparently, by the time that we get to the formula of Concord in 1577, no mention of de servo arbitrio sufficed in Lutheran writings without supplementary reference to Luther's Genesis com commentary, specifically chapter 26. In Bondage the Will, Luther had maintained that when Ezekiel says that God does not desire the death of the sinner, he is speaking, says Luther, of the published offer of God's mercy, not of the dreadful hidden will of God, which is another thing. It is of the published mercy that we must tend, but, quote, God in his own nature and majesty is to be left alone. In this regard, we have nothing to do with him, nor does he wish us to deal with him. As far as his righteousness is concerned, quote, 
God does not deplore the death of his people, which he himself works in them, but he deplores the death which he finds in his people and desires to remove from them. As for God hidden in majesty, quote again, he neither deplores nor takes away death, but works life and death and all in all, nor has he set bounds to himself by his word, but has kept himself free over all things. Like Calvin, Luther believed that we are not to inquire into, only to adore that will. And like Calvin, he quotes Romans 9.20 in this connection. But there is a tension here, to say the least, and Bart justifiably sought to remove it. According to Luther, God in his word tells us that he's not bound by his word. He tells us to look to his son. But what we see in the son is not God himself, but God quad nos towards us. Quad nos believers, particularly, not unbelievers. And that is, like Calvin, problematic. So, in the first lecture, we noted that the very existence of evil and sin, suffering and pain, shows us how difficult it is for us to understand God's holiness, love, and power in conjunction with them. How it is that God has loved the world in Christ, we shall only know at the end of time. I dare to believe that we shall only then understand the right, the nature and extent of the atonement, the nature and meaning of God's desire that all should be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Meanwhile, we believe that we truly see in Jesus Christ the merciful face of God, and nothing in that face is deformed or distorted if we maintain the glad election of grace and the sad reality of resistance as the text of Scripture places them before us. To know more, we must wait until we know as we are known. C.S. Lewis makes this point memorably, until we have faces. After the sad and bitter deprivation that marked long weary years of her life, Oriwell, Queen of Gloam, is permitted to utter her complaint before the gods, and she begins but the force of her words disintegrate before her very eyes and ears. The judge says only one thing. Are you answered? The judge has said nothing. Are you answered? Yes, says Orwell. There is much edification implied in the thought, said Kierkegaard, that against God we are always in the wrong. As he puts it in a sermon on the unchangeableness of God, God is eternal clearness. It was a leader in Israel, familiar with justice, who spoke what is the penultimate word for us on election, on the occasion that his family was judged. He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes, Eli. It is an ultimately trustworthy word because and not in spite of the appearance of the ultimate word, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, whom to follow is not to walk in darkness, but to have the light of life. For God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Well, I know it's been quite long, uh, and uh, it's a warm, warm afternoon here, and I'm looking forward to my sip of water and to your uh, questions and comments, including critical ones. Um, I was surprised to see Simeon pressed into Kant's service, uh, or sorry, Kant pressed into Simeon's service, yep. a critical moment yep. into uh, theological humility, I suppose. I wonder how far you want to rule out the possibility that we can think eternity. And I'm wondering if you could talk, speaking of balance, about balanced theological judgment when it comes to knowing the eternal God and maybe give us some words of advice as to how we should think about faith seeking understanding. Can we, is understanding conceptual? And if the concepts we use uh, are trying to understand the God who is all things and eternal, are they metaphysical concepts? Or are we to think with non-metaphysical concepts? And I, think, I guess the bottom line is how do we think through faith seeking understanding in light of the emphasis you and Simeon have, have put on paradox. Uh, thanks, uh, 
Kevin, you're right, it can't press into the service, I guess, of Simeon or of theology. To what extent can we think eternity? I'm tempted to say categorically, not at all can we think of it. Um, I was at a conference not so long ago when some question was asked about time and eternity, or at least a question which took in that particular issue. And my response was threefold. A, I don't need to know. I don't know. B, I don't need to know. C, I turned it back to the questioner, why do you need to know? They weren't very keen on that response. <clears throat> so I, I think that the answer would have to be in a way ad hoc, that is, one might say this or that about eternity, deny this or that about eternity, but really, as for a positive conception of it, I don't think we can have any. Now, that leads into the question of metaphysics, faith, and understanding. I know it's a, it's a deep and complex one. Certainly, our understanding has conceptual form. Uh, I've not been able to say what I've said today without having some sort of conceptual form. And uh, a question was asked here the other day, wasn't it, about does God is love mean God is necessarily love or essentially love? And I'm willing to make that kind of metaphysical com commitment. But yes, I suppose that I don't think that theological understanding takes primarily the form of metaphysics. I'd be happy to call it an existential understanding uh, as long as one didn't uh, by that mean existentialist in a sort of heavy, structured, philosophically existentialist sense, which ruled out ontological claims. With the word ontology, maybe I, I come to where I should have come to sooner. I think there's a distinction between an ontological claim and sort of metaphysical information or metaphysical knowledge. I make, may make certain claims about God of an ontological kind. God is good. God is necessarily good. Those could be called ontological or metaphysical. But ask me more than to say that ask me to go into that necessity, ask me the relation of will to nature, and I think we don't know. So faith-seeking understanding, it simply seeks to understand best it can for the purposes of faith and for the purposes of obedience. But the speculative itch which leads to exploration is one which maybe has some sort of place in human life somewhere, but I doubt if it's well-directed when it comes to this kind of question. So I think, I think Kant is salutary in that respect. I think, uh, although of course I wouldn't take Kant's position on revelation, God, and Christianity, what he does do is to expose a lot of metaphysical baggage, as it were, that has come along with theological belief and show that we very often are wandering around here in the realm of the unknowable. But come back at me, you, and anybody else who thinks I'm talking too strongly at that point and who, who I'm conceding too much. Um, I do want to piggyback on what Van Hooser um, was saying, and I was hoping that you would hit on particular redemption today, and so this question is going to kind of gear you that way. Um, in scripture, it talks about election as being before the foundation of the world, and it also talks about, makes the metaphysical claim of Christ being slain before the foundation of the world. And so in light of what you said about election and the gospel general call, as well as the specific effectual call, I was wondering how the gospel call could be genuine when Christ was slain before the foundation of the world if it was only for a particular amount of people then it might appear that the genuineness is not an actual possibility, not even theoretical either. So just some interaction with particular redemption as well as um, election being metaphysical with Christ being slain before the foundation of the world. Thanks, Eric. Uh, that is a huge one, of course. And uh, I think the um, advertised, advertised title for today, whether this session or last one was particular redemption, uh, to answer it briefly is very, very difficult indeed, uh, I think. My own conviction increasingly is that the question, the extent of atonement or, if you like, redemption, let's say extent of atonement, is something which we cannot answer 
that it is something whose answer is eschatological. Because the atonement is often talked of in particular terms in Scripture. In fact, I even think it's probably more to often talked of in particular terms than in wider terms. But then, you see, th think of the balance uh, that of material in the Old Testament in this respect. What is talked about most in the Old Testament? Adam and Eve and the general fall or Israel's particular sins? Answer, far and away Israel. Hardly anything on Adam and Eve compared to Israel. Which is the more important? The story of Adam and Eve or the story of Israel? Well, you might say Adam and Eve is actually fundamental to Israel. So a lot of time is spent in Israel, even though actually uh, the question of Adam and Eve is fundamental, or, or creation of four, I should say, is fundamental as well. Now, in the same way, there are many references to atonement in the New Testament. As I say, perhaps the most where it does seem to be the particular people of God that is in mind. But we cannot infer from that, I think, a particularity to the redemption of a kind that rules other people out. It is simply that it is talking about what applies to this particular group of people. And there are, of course, verses which suggest its universality as well. I think we have to be most careful here. When our Lord, for example, in John 17 says, I do not pray for the world, is not an indication that his prayers at all times are only for his own disciples. Because earlier on we told God loved the world. So what he's saying is, I do not pray for the world which God loved. I do not at this time, at this juncture here, this is what not I'm doing. I'm not praying for the world. It's not a statement. I never pray for the world in any form at all. So given the fact that the uh, the, 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 the true scope of salvation in all its width, what we were talking about earlier today, the relation of, of the coming in of the nations to the elect people in the book of Revelation in our early session, given that all that only unravels before our eyes in the eschaton, myself, I have become increasingly convinced that the question of the extent of the atonement is not anything that can be settled, as a matter of fact, here on earth. We have to wait and see, as it were. And that also impacts the question of the nature of the atonement. Uh, when uh, McLeod Campbell wrote his work on the nature of the atonement, he saw clearly that what had been said, for example, by John Owen on the extent of the atonement raises the question of its whole nature. What it was that the Son of God fully did in bearing the penalty of sins, how he loved the world in that, what uh, the scope of love and mercy in its practical outreach has been, that in its working out is something we must yet await. I could, of course, put this far more briefly by saying that there is to the atonement, I think, a universality and a particularity. In Romans 5, there's a universality. You know, whatever Adam did, Jesus Christ more than undoes all that. Um, so however extensive the, the the uh, damage caused by Adam, Jesus Christ, is, is even greater. And yet, Scripture concentrates then so often, not always, of course, so often in the exposition on the way the atonement applies to the church, just as in the Old Testament, the sacrifices apply to the people of Israel. Given the difference between Israel and the Gentiles, whether all are elect and are called to obedience yeah. or not, and I haven't quite been able to tell, and then your response, I have a, based on your response, I have a further question. Th thanks for that. Uh, it's a complex issue because I think many things go on in scripture which we tend to bundle together. Uh, so for example, the case of Esau and the case of Pharaoh we talked about earlier today, and the case of those Jews who heard the gospel and rejected Jesus Christ, they're not all the same cases, different things going on there. The, the, the preposition used more than once in Scripture is ek, that God has called people out from among the Gentiles. But the contrast which Paul sets up in Romans 9 11 is that there is a discrimination. God calls Jacob rather than Esau. Although, as I said this morning, I don't think that means the reprobation of Esau, as a matter of fact. But still, the benefit of eschatological salvation is there for Jacob too. And yet, at the same time, 
uh, there are those who stumble in Israel, it says in Romans 9-11, because they pursue righteousness not by faith, but by works. So, we are we're confronted with two things, I think. Or well, let's say three things. We are confronted with the universality of God's provision in Jesus Christ, potentially, anyway. We are to go out and proclaim it to all people in all nations, which means a universality of potential provision there, as far as I'm concerned. Secondly, there is a reality of those who actually reject the message. Uh, and God can, in that context, uh, harden hearts. Though the hardening he, I think, deploys is on account of the prior self hardening by Egypt. And thirdly, there is an effective election. Now, one thing I'm trying to get over in this session is that those cannot be put together in a conceptual scheme, the one conceptual scheme very easily. But A, I don't think we need to. I don't see why, because it doesn't affect me existentially to put these together. I still ought to do this or ought not to do that. And secondly, I think that the book of Revelation suggests to us, or the placing of Revelation, there at the end of the New Testament, um, and the content, is an indication that really we will not see the resolution of all these different things until then. Just as with the Old Testament itself, we do not at the end of the Old Testament know how everything will work out. So, theologically, we'd be much too confident that we think that by the end of the New Testament we see how everything works out. We don't. The book of Revelation, I think, is a warning to us that there are things yet to be worked out which we don't know about. A follow-up question or maybe an observation, um, that same uh, centrifugal or vociferating force could also be seen in the influence, I mean it goes all the way back to Augustine really, uh, when Augustine's influence was revived uh, in the 16th and 17th century under Bishop Jansenius, that itself caused, I mean, huge disruption. Now the, the structure of the Roman church was such that, I mean, they were condemned you know, over a century long to, to expel it, and Jansenism sort of, you know, lived a subterranean existence. They, a lot of people claim Irish Catholicism was essentially Jansenistic in its whole approach, etc. But the odd thing is, once it kind of got expelled, you know, I mean, there's just, like with Vatican II, it's very hard to be, to continue Jansenism, uh, it kind of disappears, and almost, you know, a, a, an error can tend to the other side, where people are so lazy about, you know, the universal outreach of God's will, you know, and then it's only dialogue with other religions, no evangelization. I mean, it's this, you know, balance that has to be maintained. But I'm always struck with once uh, an Augustinian influence in the Catholic Church is, uh, the spell is there broken, it too is very hard to revive. Um, so there's a kind of a parallel there. You know, Bionism and Jansenism simply is just not a live option to most Catholic theologians. Yes, thank you. In, in preparation for these lectures, although I didn't uh, ultimately make use of his work, I read Pascal quite carefully on uh, some of the controversies in the, in the 17th century concerning uh, uh, Janssen. Uh, I've, uh, the Augustinian legacy here is something which one has to ponder, I think, very carefully. I, I think that there are things in Augustine which mute, actually, the rather stronger notes struck in Calvinism at times. But there seems to be something, and I mentioned this in the first lecture, quoting Paul Jewett um, and Birkauer. Um, there seems to be something uncommonly intractable about this particular issue. There's something about it that has a strongly divisive effect. And what counts for exactly, I don't know. Uh, some people have said, you know, that the reformers got all worked up about this because they were in the heat of reformation uh, breaking from the Catholic Church, and of course they were all hot and excited. But from what I've seen, and I'm no expert in this, there's nothing particularly there that Gottschalk and Hinkmer of Reims didn't argue about in the ninth century yeah. with equal ferocity long before the Reformation. It, it touches a nerve, doesn't it? And I suppose it has to do with something very, very fundamental in our appropriation of the nature of God. Ultimately, 
is there something in us which inclines us in our perceptions either to make his sovereignty outweigh everything or to make his love outweigh everything? Do we have real difficulty holding those two things together? And is it so difficult that people will in the end plump for one in preference to the other, how rather much they're saying they're holding both together? And then having plumped for one rather than the other, you get naturally angry if uh, the sovereignty seems to be denied on one side and dismayed if the love seems to be um, denied on the other one. You had mentioned, I think, in the earlier part of, uh, of your message here, um, I think you, it was along the lines of the, an error of pitting uh, God's mercy against his justice. And that, uh, I guess, in my own recall of it, something like, me, perhaps we should, we ought to um, see it as one type of mercy played against another type of mercy instead uh, of such a diametric uh, type of contrast. And, um, and then uh, you had mentioned about the summons, the summonses in both cases, and uh, in one case you get one type of response, in another case a, a, a different response. Um, but, but, but your emphasis, what you were accenting was mercy in both cases, albeit perhaps uh, mercy uh, uh, offered or, or uh, effectuated in different ways. But, but so what I want to want to know is um, if the su if if we take that line of thought, how do you see the summons being um, active and, and viable outside of the actual summons? Um, touching, touching those that, that receive it. Um, outside of the covenant community, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, actually being amongst the people offering it. So to those that are completely don't hear it in the concrete sense of the word, uh, how do you, how should we, what would you make of this idea of a summons going to both types of groups, for lack of a better word, and, and should we pursue that accent Thank you. Uh, well, I welcome the question. It's, um, it's a little outside my remit as I've interpreted it uh, in this context, of course, because that raises the whole question of the fate of the unevangelized, doesn't it? And here we have a whole different area opened up from anything I've touched on because you can talk about judgment um, and summons also, I suppose, according to a moral law, according to general revelation. Those certainly are concepts I'd want to make uh, some use of in that connection. I don't doubt, therefore, that God has a way outside the proclamation of the gospel of actually making people accountable to himself. And although I would not want any simplistic responses here, in fact, I'd want to look very carefully at different scenarios, nevertheless, uh, that people can be laid under some sort of responsibility or obligation to respond to that which is within their scope of their ability to respond, even outside the gospel, and can be judged on that basis. If any such people enter the eschatological kingdom, it is still entirely by grace. It's still on the basis of atonement and something done for them, not on the basis of works. But that is something which, although I've not dealt with it at all in these lectures, I've hinted that I believe is eschatologically again resolved rather than anything we can be sure about. You're right in terms of mercy and justice. Uh, there is a place, of course, for contrasting mercy and justice. I accept that. But I want to make it, uh, I want to, to refine, as I suggested, the way this is set up because there is a relation of one mercy to another, although that is the effective call as opposed to the general summons to those who hear the message, I mean. Uh, but their relationship, I think, cannot be known. And the same way, um, where mercy is given, it's given through a just atonement, an atonement which is just as well as merciful. That's not very illuminating, but it, it's a huge issue and quite difficult to open up without going into considerable detail, I guess. But yes, I, I, I certainly believe there is a form of summons, a form of rejection, which is outside the circle of those who heard the word. 